Welcome to the Sigma FP and Friends, the movie. Because yes, it is as long as a feature film. It is also known by this less flashy title. This is a movie for nerds because I will be talking about geeky things like how raw files work, experimental data rates of all the raws, clipping point calculations, and so much more. It is also a movie for the more hands-on people because Yuan will be talking about rigging and he will be giving advice on all Sigma-related stuff that you need to buy from monitor mounts to media storage. You can also enjoy this if you want to see real-life situation footage, both night shots and day shots. At the end, the conclusion is an open discussion about our experience with the three rows, which one we prefer and why. Thanks to YouTube chapters, you can now scroll through to what pleases your heart the most. And so we begin with chapter one. Presented by my better half and rig master, Yuan. This is practically my favorite rigging system for the Sigma FP. You have a small rig cage for the Sigma FP. You need a cage because uh, you can't really hook it up to a lot of things. We have an adapter. We use uh, EF cinema lenses usually. We use a dummy battery system with a V-mount battery here mounted on a small rig plate, a small, small rig plate. It's a small rig handle. It has an airy locking system, which is very, very useful. And we have this uh, mechanism, this uh, also small rig, so it's always, everything here is practically small rig, I don't see anything else. Uh, this is very good because you can tilt it and pan it the way you want. Of course this would come with the uh, NPF batteries or you can uh, put it uh, on D-tap to the V-mount battery. With the 50 ma battery from a uh, small rig this keeps for like two hours, the whole rig. I definitely have two or at least three for a uh, whole day shoot. We like to use the SD cards. Uh, they're um, V90s. They're very, very useful. They're 128 gigs, so you have roughly 20 minutes of uh, footage on it on 3 to 1 ratio. I use a small rig cable because it's very thin and it's very light and I like it because it doesn't hold the ports down. Of course I use um, this complementary accessory that comes with the Sigma FP that uh, holds the HDMI cable in place. And uh, of course we can use the USB-C here to uh, mount to an SSD. We use a variety of SSDs with the Blackmagic, Samsung T5, the Sam SanDisk, uh, this is a SanDisk 1TB Extreme Portable and uh, this is um, a homemade one. You practically buy a case and you put an NVMe M.2 to USB-C adapter and uh, you can buy whatever SSD you find on, on the net. You can put whatever you want in it and uh, it will work just fine with the Blackmagic. The only one that we had a problem with is the T7 Touch. For some reason the Blackmagic doesn't want to recognize that as an SSD. We can also adapt SATA 3 SSD to the Blackmagic. These are the cheapest things you can buy. Eternal SSDs, uh, they look like this. This is uh, not a cheap one, but uh, you can buy a cheaper one because the Blackmagic doesn't have such a fast transfer rate. So um, you can use all of these, no issues. This could also be used as a video assist, of course. And um, uh, what you would have to do is uh, use a USB-C cable. You have to make sure that it's a very good cable because uh, we had a lot of issues with the CDNG out of the Sigma. There are not many SSDs that can work fine with it. You have to make sure that you have a fast SSD and a good cable. The problem being that if the SSD gets hot, uh, the Sigma stops it and it stops the recording. Most SSDs go for like 12 or 17 minutes and that is a big issue because uh, if you have long shots and it gets hot you have to stop and take a long break before it can record again otherwise it's just going to record like 10 or 20 seconds and that's not a professional way of uh, working with the Sigma. I think the longest that survived recording with the, the Sigma FP was the T7, the Samsung SSD, and uh, that kept recording for like 40 minutes and then it did 12 minutes and then it did like one minute and a half and stuff like that. So definitely I wouldn't record uh, CDNG if um, I have uh, long shots to record. 
I'd definitely buy a Samsung SSD just to make sure that it's going to work correctly. The cables are pretty good. And uh, I would buy a T5 or a T7, not bigger than one terabyte, because I heard uh, the bigger they are, they get slower or they have issues. So uh, I would uh, stick to Samsung and I would stick to short uh, shots. Of course, if I want to record CDNG, I put this in, I put this here. This is a T5 and uh, you, can, you, you connect to that. Are we still recording? Well, okay. So here we go. This is the Ninja. Ninja is much better because it's got holes here, see? It gets nice and snug even if it's not very tight. Remove the SSD because you can't use the SSD with the Ninja. The problem with the Ninja being, uh, of course, uh, you only have one battery slot and um, just one sort of media. You have uh, this type of caddy that you put in here. We were very keen on uh, the Crucial MX 500s and uh, they worked for, for a little while, they worked pretty fine. But then we discovered that after uh, an hour of recording, they would, they would show us the kangaroo, the yellow kangaroo of death. And that means it just stops recording for a few frames and then it starts recording again. And after 20 minutes, it does it, it does it again. So if you have an interview, you're practically going to lose a few frames and that's not really good. That's why we went to these. These are much better. They don't show the kangaroo. We've tried them for like two hours and a half and there was no kangaroo in sight. So yeah, buy these. These are like the cheapest from the ones that I actually work. When it comes to viewing the image on the monitor, your best chance of seeing something close to the dynamic range of the RAW files is the Ninja 5. I've noticed that in some lighting situations it's better if you use the HLG monitoring, whereas in others, the native setting is better. Both Sigma's display and Blackmagic Video Assist 12G show a crunched down Rec. 709 image. When shooting outside like in this example, the highlights will be shown blown way before they actually are. Sigma FP has two ways of professionally monitoring the exposure when shooting. False colors and EL zone. If you want to know more details about these, we have dedicated videos for both. The problem, however, is that you can't access any of these functions if you want to output RAW onto any recorder. The only way in which you can access the functions with a recorder is if you set the recorder on monitoring, not on RAW. It's not the false colors from the... Oh, it's not Atoms. Ninja's false colors. Yes. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, you, you, you actually see the info. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. If we have one of these shots that is on the underexposed side, both the false colors from the Ninja and the real ones that you get, meaning the ones from the Sigma FP, are similar. But if you go outside, the monitor that shows the false colors makes a very big difference. And the only real false colors that you can guide yourself on are from Sigma, not the ones from Atomos or Blackmagic. Digital camera sensors consist of an array of photocytes. These are light sensitive elements. They convert the light that falls onto the sensor to digital intensity values. The sensor's ability to capture color is given by a Bayer pattern. This is an arrangement of red, green, and blue filters placed on each photocyte in that particular pattern. However, the images we're used to, the standard RGB images, require all three primary color values, so R, G, and B, at each pixel location. So there has to be a process that converts the Bayer pattern into a visible RGB image. The most important bit of it is the demosaic algorithm. In non-RAW images, this is the usual process. 
The bare image is processed and turned into a normal imaging camera, which packages the digital signal into various video formats, like MOV, MPEG-4, etc. This packaging compresses the image and, as such, quality is decreased. RAW files are of two types, compressed and uncompressed. This is to say most of the RAW formats have a certain amount of processing applied to them. They do not simply contain the raw data from the sensor. Besides the demosaic process, other raw processing options include stuff like noise reduction, anti-aliasing, and low-pass filter for moiré suppression. What goes in here depends on the sensor and camera manufacturer. Since CDNG is uncompressed, we should be seeing the largest amount of noise. I couldn't find any information as to whether B-RAW or ProRes RAW formats have baked-in noise reduction, but based on what I saw in the footage that I shot, I think both ProRes RAW and B-RAW have some. Scroll here to see the results from these tests. ProRes RAW directly encodes the bare pattern. The demosaic and further processing is done in your computer when you import it in the editing software. That being said, Final Cut Pro does a very good job at processing ProRes RAW seamlessly. I haven't tried ProRes RAW processing in any other editing software, but I do recommend Final Cut. It works just as well as the optimized media that it creates. As a codec, the ProRes RAW uses the same principles and underlying technology as the old ProRes codecs, but applies them to a camera sensor's pristine raw image data, not the conventional image pixels. It is a compressed RAW. ProRes RAW data rates are proportional to frame rates and resolution, but vary according to image content significantly more than old ProRes RAW formats do. Although normal, not raw, ProRes is a variable bitrate video codec, an Apple white paper on this matter says that the variability is usually small and the actual data rate is close to the target data rate. So essentially, since the ProRes RAW is designed to maintain constant quality and very high image fidelity for all of its frames, it will have higher data rates for images with greater detail or noise. B-RAW is an interesting codec because it does much of the demosaic process in camera as opposed to inside the computer, thus giving your CPU a break and making the post-production flow smooth and fast without compromising on the image quality. B-RAW is Blackmagic Design's baby and whilst it is a very light and user-friendly codec, it does not compromise on quality. It is also a compressed codec like ProRes RAW. Blackmagic RAW has also been made free like CDNG. BMD released an SDK, a software development kit for it. This codec offers an extensive array of metadata and parameters you can change in the camera or menu of DaVinci, although I should say that B-RAW from Sigma FP is more limited than B-RAW from a Blackmagic camera. B-RAW has two methods of encoding constant bitrate and constant quality. As I was saying for this project, I used constant bitrate 3 to 1, but I have to say I looked at all the other compression ratios and I hardly saw any difference between 3 to 1 and 12 to 1, even though the data rate was much much smaller. This is Adobe's baby, who wanted to create an industry-wide open file format for digital cinema files. It was the first of its kind, a raw video image format for video cameras. When imported in the computer, the CDNG files are visualized as individual DNG pictures for each frame of your video. They also contain metadata and audio files, but at the present moment, they are only playable as videos if you import them in an editing software. CDNG is the only true raw from our three flavors of raw, 
in the sense that it is uncompressed, hence the huge data rate. However, it doesn't necessarily mean it will automatically yield the best image because it will still go through a processing phase once you import it in your editing software. So the way the software does the processing is essential. Another notable thing is how you conduct your color grading workflow. For example, both CD and GNB RAW can be edited in DaVinci, but if we go to the camera RAW menu, the options from B RAW are different than the ones from CD and G. I find the CD and G menu much more appealing. I tend to change the highlights, shadows, and contrast settings from here rather than the color wheels. I also find that if you apply the easy BMD color space workflow, as I do for this video, the image looks significantly less flat than the bureau image that went through the same process. That being said, I think that if I dig deeper and try an ACES workflow, for example, it might allow me to squeeze more out of my CDNG. In conclusion, do not decide to use CDNG because it's automatically better than the other RAWs. Whilst it is open source and provides excellent quality uncompressed media, it is very large and a bit of a pain to work with. I recommend that you read David Osterberry's article on raw files. He does a great job of explaining how everything works. For this video, I'll just be taking into consideration the 4K, 23.98p to 30p data rates. EOS HD's test with 12-bit CDNG out of Sigma FP recorded a whopping 2400 megabits per second on an SSD. B raw. Even though Sigma FP's highest resolution is 4K, its sensor is 6K. Since Sigma FP's maximum resolution is 4K, we should be seeing B raw data rates comparable to the Blackmagic Pocket Camera 4K. In these tests, I only use B raw 3 to 1 ratio. So the data rate according to this should be around 136 megabytes per second, which is 1088 megabits per second. First raw. Since the ProRes RAW's data rates are shown to be somewhere between ProRes 42 HQ and ProRes 42, this table gives us the ballpark approximation of 524 to 786 megabits per second. These are our experimental data rates. We've got a mix of static shots, dynamic shots, shots which have a lot of details or fewer details in them. CDNG doesn't much care about anything that's in the shot. The data rate is pretty much the same in all of the shots. b -raw varies by a lot, which is weird because as I shot at constant bitrate 3 to 1 ratio, I should see well, a constant bitrate throughout the examples. Another observation here is that on average Sigma FP compresses its 4K image at almost a half of the bitrate of Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K. Coming back to our three flavors of RAW comparison. As expected from the white paper on this matter, Porous RAW varies. Even if we take the highest B raw bitrate from here, it is still around 32% off the average CDNG bitrate. The average B raw bitrate is 23% off the average CDNG bitrate, whilst the average ProS raw bitrate is about 18% off the same average CDNG bitrate. So we save up around 77% of space if we choose B raw 3 to 1 instead of CDNG or 82% of space if we choose ProS RAW. I would, however, get an extra storage media for both B RAW and ProS RAW, since you might end up getting some pretty fat bit rates depending on the characteristics of your shots. Let's see the kind of metadata we can get from Final Cut on ProS RAW files. Go to Info over here. This is my own menu for these settings. And everything else that you see here is what Final Cut has automatically. So let's go to Extended so we can see as much as possible. This was already set on Extended. We don't really see a lot over here. We can see the ISO, the color temperature, the resolution, the frame rate, the camera model, nothing on the lens. 
That being said, I was using cine lenses here. Hmm, let's see. On another file. And again, no information on the lens aperture or any other lens details. Even though I used a photo lens and the lens information is shown in DaVinci for the Bureau and CDNG files, as you will see later on. I also have the app media info, which I use if I want to see more detailed metadata on any of my files. For Paris Raw, this is what we get. Right, let's see what we can find out in terms of metadata. In DaVinci for CDNG, we're going to see here camera the, the camera that we used that we also see for Paris Raw, the ISO that we shot at, and details on the lens that we used, the focal point that we have, and the aperture. Obviously, you only get this information for photo lenses, not for cine lenses. For b -Raw, let's do the same thing, and this is what you get. So again, you get the ISO, you get the color temperature, aperture, da -da -dum, and the bitrate. You have a bit more data in the metadata if you shoot b -Raw than if you shoot CDNG. Just a tad. I also have the app media info, which I use if I want to see more detailed metadata on any of my files. So let's see what we get for B-Raw from here. This is what you're getting. And for CDNG, as you can see, and as you already know, if you want to visualize the file outside DaVinci, you have individual DNG photos. Oh, I can't even use this. Great. So I can't get any information with media info. Taking into account my plus or minus 0 0.5 EV error, CDNG and Bureau respect the clipping values given by the producers of the camera. Paris Raw falls short and clips about one f-stop higher for all of the ISOs higher than 400. Let's look at all of this in detail. CDNG shows the closest values to the EV provided by Sigma. For ISO 100, we have exposure value 2.5. However, the next exposure that we measured was plus 3.5. So in reality, I'm expecting my CDNG's clipping value to be at 3.0. But the experiment wasn't designed in steps of 0.5 EV, so I can't vouch for that. However, if we look for all the column and add in the error of plus or minus 0.5 EV, all my CDNG values are consistent with what we're getting from Sigma. Bureau produces the same results as CDNG up to ISO 3200. I think that the result is due to my error in measuring the light more than anything else. So even though we see this discrepancy here between CDNG and Bureau, I would count it as a human error rather than the footage's error. The clipping point for Paris Raw starts being lower than our theoretical value, as well as our measured values for CDNG and B Raw, starting with ISO 800. Same thing for ISO 1600, same thing for ISO 3200, 6400, and then a very big discrepancy for ISO. 12,800. Highlight recovery in Paris Raw is very cumbersome and it does not produce similar results as with CDNG and Bureau. It doesn't have a highlight recovery button and that makes a lot of difference. I've tried a number of ways to process the footage and recover the clipped area. First, using HDR tools plus color wheels and curves. Then, from the new button, Final Cut introduced in one of the latest updates, color adjustments. No good. Then I went to the menu that offers camera raw options. Modify Paris Raw settings. This didn't help either. Whether Paris Raw footage from Sigma FP is actually worse than CDNG and B Raw when it comes to dynamic range in the headroom area, or it is simply a matter of time until post production programs learn a better way to maximize the information from it, remains to be seen. B 
Bureau and Prorosaur have comparable noise levels and the image looks very good up to and including ISO 3200, even in very underexposed areas. CDNG has significantly higher noise than the other two rows across the board. Whilst not illustrated in this table, underexposed ISO 3200 footage looks, as expected, cleaner than its ISO 1600 and even ISO 800 counterpart for all the rows. Let's compare the noise levels between the three rows in more detail. Let's look at ISO 400 for example. For Bureau, we can see that all the values of our noise levels are okay for all of the exposures that we used. For Prorus Raw, we can see that for the exposure of negative 4, the noise level is unacceptable. However, not by a lot. So when comparing this value for Bureau with this value for Prorus Raw, they're not very different. If we compare the corresponding value for CDNG, we can see that the noise levels are significantly higher than both Bureau and Prorus Raw. Let's look at ISO 3200 now. Here's the value for Bureau and here's the corresponding value for Prorus Raw. Here Prorus Raw is actually slightly lower than Bureau. So overall, Bureau and Prorus Raw have comparable noise levels where CDNG has significantly higher values across the board. When choosing the RAW you want to use with Sigma, you should also factor in what editing software you are most comfortable with. Here's a table of three of the most widely used software and their support for each RAW. If you absolutely want to use Bureau in Final Cut, apparently as of January 2023, you have this app called Bureau Toolbox that you can buy off the Mac App Store and it costs 80 bucks. So this app is openable from Final Cut in the effects menu and it allows you to have control of your Bureau. I would wait for something more stable that comes from Final Cut as opposed to a standalone app with Final Cut integration. That being said, I haven't used it, so I don't know how well it works, but it looks pretty good. On the supported file formats page, Premiere lists the Cinema DNG as being supported but then it lists Blackmagic cameras as two out of the three contenders it can support CDNG from. In any case, Sigma FP is not on this list. This is what happens when you try to import the Prorus RAW file in Final Cut. There used to be a message that asked you if you want to conform this file to Rec 709 space and you had to manually go to HDR tools and conform it from here. At some point when they updated this, they do an automatic color conform. So in my opinion, what they do automatically looks better than what you do with the HDR tools. This would be something similar. And you can also go to manual and change your settings from here. You can still keep the HDR tools. However, as I was saying, it does a very good job automatically. Then what you have to do is go to info. And this is where you play with the ProRes RAW settings. You have this menu here where you can change your ISO. Very important. You can change your exposure offset. Again, very nice. And the color temperature. And then we have the raw to log conversion. If you want to add a lot from here, you really have to change the raw to log conversion from none to something, because if you leave it on none, then you are going to get very bad results. 
there aren't huge differences between these logs, so it really depends on your taste. Then you go to the camera LUT and select a LUT that you like. If you want to use raw to log conversion and LUTs, you can uncheck the color conform button since raw to log conversion essentially does the same job of restricting the raw's high dynamic range to something viewable on an SDR display. That is, if you left your default library color processing setting on standard. Now let's see what this low light footage looks like with different raw to log conversions. What I want to point out is that we don't have any BM film option like we do on DaVinci with CDNG and B-Raw. We do, however, have two Blackmagic design options for the LUTs. Again, much less than the number of options in DaVinci. And the last example on this matter, daylight with a very dark subject. The raw to log conversion was set to Canon Log 2 Cinema Gamut. And these are various options for the LUT. In terms of the metadata information, you only have these settings that you can access from Modify Porous Raw Settings. You don't have the aperture or a highlight recovery button. I want to draw attention to one last very important thing for Porous Raw, which is if you have one long shot and you cut parts of it in the timeline and make changes in the Porous Raw menu, the change you make for one bit will automatically be carried out on all the other bits of the clip. This is a huge pain with ProRes RAW. So make sure that if you are shooting something with changes in exposure within the frame, you stop the recording and then start again before you pause to the second exposure. Let's look here. We have these settings, and now we go to another bit of our clip, which we cut, and here we have the same settings. Let's change this to None, and the ProRes RAW settings to None. And you will have the same thing in the raw settings on the other clip now. The only thing that doesn't translate is the color conform from the main tab. If I had any color wheels here, those wouldn't have transferred either. For Bureau and CDNG, we open DaVinci and we go to the color tab. This is what we have in terms of the camera raw settings. The most versatile way to do color grading is to use decode using clip and change these options. There is a wide discussion concerning the ACES workflow, which I'm not going to go into right now. I usually use the Blackmagic Design color space with the Blackmagic Design film or even the Blackmagic Design Extended Video. For the sake of starting from the flattest point possible in Blackmagic Design, let's go to Blackmagic Design Film. Here we have the Highlight Recovery button, and we have a Color Temperature tab, Exposure tab, as well as an extensive menu for the Gamma Controls. What you don't have if you choose to use Sigma FP is the change in ISO. In terms of LUTs, we have again an extensive array of LUTs that we can choose from. And let's just go to Blackmagic Design, which I tend to use often if I use this particular workflow. And what I want to show you is that there are differences in the way in which the graded image looks. If we use the same settings that we used for the BM and apply them to the CDNG file. For CDNG, we don't have such a big range of things over here, but we have the same color space and Blackmagic Design film. Again, as with the B-RAW from Sigma FP, the CDNG also doesn't have a change in ISO in the RAW menu, which is a problem. We're going to apply the, the grade. And the only thing that gets copied is the LUT. Right, so we had the exposure down too. So there is a huge difference in how this looks, right? This one with this one. The Bureau image is flatter and the CDNG image is more saturated, more contrasty, 
and it has a bit of a yellow tint. The color temperature set on the camera is the same for both of these. However, in the camera raw menu, this one is this value and this one is this value. So let's try to put this at. Okay, let's see, now they're the same. It's a bit better, but there's still a difference in flatness.
so we're gonna go back to info, modify power settings. So we played with this one. Let's try Panasonic Vlog. This one kind of looks like the bureau. The tint is a bit more reddish, like the bureau. Paras Ra is a bit flatter than bureau. And CDNG as well. Icon is very reddish. Let's go back to a Canon one. And let's check it out with other LUTs.
for the shots that you're going to see, all the rows were graded using Canon Cinema Gamut with Canon Log 2. This was in order for us to make the best direct comparison that we can between all three of them. I corrected all the footage for exposure in order to maximize the amount of highlights that I could recover. For Bureau and CDNG, I've used Color Space Transform, but I exposure corrected them using different settings from the camera raw as well as the HDR color wheel. For these CDNG shots, what I wanted to show you is the false colors that you're getting on the Sigma FP screen versus the real image that you're recording. The second thing I wanted to show you here is that if you're shooting outside in broad daylight, you might want to shoot at higher ISOs if you want to recover more from your highlight section. And then just use an anti-filter or change an f-stop to control the amount of light you're getting. For ISO 400, there should be more recovered details. I can tell on my monitor, I'm not really sure that this is going to translate on YouTube. It's a very fine difference.
A while ago we got this comment on one of our clips. It's a really well constructed thought on the matter of clipping points variability with ISO. I want to draw attention to the part about filming puffy clouds where he says that when using ISO 800 you will see nice gradients in the gray. Let's summarize this info with our Sigma FP dynamic range chart over here. The idea is that in broad daylight your struggle is to keep as much detail as possible in your highlighted areas such as the sky with clouds since your subject will most definitely be exposed a few stops lower than the sky. So looking at the dynamic range chart, what is important is this gray range here called the headroom, which tells you how many stops above middle gray you can recover from your highlights. So clearly the first ISO that allows us the most headroom is ISO 800. Here is what Sigma tells us in their Sigma FP dual base ISO technology white paper. If you haven't yet, click on this document in the description below and give it a read. It's short and to the point and it gives very useful insights as well as this dynamic range chart that I put up. Here's the short test with the same exposure of the shot at different ISOs. I used an ND filter everywhere and controlled the exposure by changing the aperture. The camera metadata image looks the same as what you see on the Sigma's monitor. So you can see that at first glance, the shot looks the same, completely blown highlights for all the ISOs. I've also included a recording of Sigma's screen with the false colors on, so you can see the real dynamic range distribution, hence the headroom. In this example, we stop having clipping from ISO 400 onwards, but I think it proves the point. So we're down to the last section of the Sigma FP saga, the conclusions, or rather the conclusion, which of the rows do we prefer? Or which of the rows do I prefer and which of the rows does he prefer? Yes, hello, uh, you all know Yun. this is my better half and the rig master. Okay, and uh, yeah, so Yun as a uh, rigger, so Yun, in terms of uh, the camera setup, which row do you prefer and why? Well, I think it's rather easy. I think everybody knows practically because uh, anybody who would deal with this camera and with all this equipment would know that Blackmagic RAW is the preferred RAW for it. There are many out there who like to shoot in Cinema DNG and to add a step in the in the post production, you know, to put the slim row in and to mm -hmm. to decrease the, the data rate. Yeah, the data, yeah. the data that you have to keep practically, because you need mm. to be rich to have CDNG raw projects and keep them on hard drives and stuff. Yeah, sure. you practically need to be rich to to work with CDNG. Many agree that the CDNG would be the best out of this camera because it's uncompressed raw and it's awesome to work with and stuff but from rigging perspectives and the fact that you need a video assist anyway and you need to work on a big rig with it to make it you know stable for projects that we worked in at least stable from the point of view of the you need to make sure that the focus is is spot mm. on you need to make sure that uh, your exposure is spot on you need to make sure of all that and you need all the stuff to work seamlessly and not to have problems with media not to have mm. problems with cables not to have problems with i don't know heating of recorders and you know mm, stuff yeah, like that heating. so all these things combined kind of like merge the sigma fp with the black magic video assist 12g in a very very nice way they're working together perfectly ninja 5 has its shortcomings Oh yeah, you were telling me about the brightness. I think you covered this in another video, but since we're talking about it, might as well maybe give us a short version. Yeah, I, I would have like three reasons why I wouldn't mm -hmm. use the Ninja 5, but there are many and mm -hmm. I would like to go as fast through them as possible. Mm -hmm. So one is the 
one battery slot. The Ninja 5 has one battery slot and the Blackmagic has two battery slots. You can swap them on the go and the Blackmagic could run practically forever as long as you have batteries for it. Right, because it doesn't run on both batteries at the same time. So it depletes one and then it goes automatically to the second yes. one. Yes, actually Ninja had uh, like a Thomas, it had that. Like, uh, the tiny one, the first one? Yeah, the Ninja 2. The, Ninja 2. the first Ninja that I had oh, yeah, was the, sure. the Ninja 2. I had two battery slots and I could like swap and it was perfect. It was excellent. Okay. Right, one battery slot for the Ninja 5, that's mm -hmm. the first and major issue. The second issue would be the media. You have only one option for media, the Ninja 5, and it's uh, very precise with what SSDs you need to use. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they're not very cheap and you know as SSDs go they're cheaper than other medias but they're not very cheap the ones that actually mm -hmm. work with the Ninja 5. Yeah because you were saying uh, well at the beginning of the video uh, there is a bit where you were talking about the kangaroo of death. Yeah the yellow kangaroo of death. Your Aussies don't like to let you have whatever SSD you would like to use and uh, unfortunately we were using the Crucial MX500 mm -hmm. which practically uh, promotes the same kind of transfer speeds of other SSDs that work with the Ninja 5. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we had many kangaroos of death and many frames Dropped disappeared. frames, yeah. Yeah, from, that from the footage. That was not a good time. And that was not useful. Yeah, it's, mm. it's not good. <laughs> and especially you don't have any proxy backup or, or backup, anything. whatever. Yeah, yeah it's, that's a major that's issue. Anything. Yeah, well... Um, so that was one? Was, that was the, the second, second one. That was the second one. Oh yeah, the battery slot was the first one. One of the reasons, other small reasons, mm -hmm. would be the nits, of course. The, the brightness mm -hmm. the of the brightness. monitor. A Ninja 5 has 1000 nits. The video assist 12G, mind you, it's newer. It's got 2500 nits. Um, yeah. I think that's Hands a down. very, very good reason to use it, especially when you're shooting outside. You will have no problems with the video assist to do focus and mm -hmm. to, you know, what about the yeah, way, the you, way rig you rig it? it? Well, the video assist has uh, six points of screwing. Like you can screw mm -hmm. the video Which assist one? in many. The Black the Magic. Videos, no, the Black Magic video assist, right. yeah. Well, it's called the video assist 12G. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the BM has six points of screwing. You practically can put it in many ways. You don't have to center it, you can put it on the side. And that's very good for rigging because you've got many options. It It doesn't get so warm as, mm -hmm. as the Ninja 5. It's got a much better ventilation system. Oh, that's good. Weirdly enough, I find it fan less than noisy. the less noisy than, than the Ninja 5. And um, yeah, it's also the numerous medias that you can use, like mm -hmm. the SD and the SSD, which is yeah. very, very good. Unfortunately, you can't do a dual record, which is kind of mm -hmm. annoying. Um, then again, you don't have the option of dual recording on CDNG or on Ferraris RAW. Yeah, with Sigma. With these things yeah, that we've well, been talking Sigma about. FP, so. you're unfortunately, the only one that I know that you can like safely record a dual is mm -hmm. to buy the, the Video Assist 12G 7 inch, yeah. which has a dual SD yes, entry. SD so sets. you can dual record. But then the, the price is much higher. It's much higher, but uh, I think that's the only way of recording Blackmagic mm. and have it safe on a camera. I don't think uh, you have any other raw options to record mm -hmm. safely, <laughs> like dual recording. Yeah, yeah. I think the Video Assist 12G 7 inch is the only one that can actually offer that. So there you is... go, Blackmagic RAW still wins. Yeah, yeah, it, it still yeah. wins. It's much easier to work with for you, mm -hmm. right? as, the, as, yeah, as, as far as I can, yeah. I can't go into the ProRes RAW workflow <laughs> you because you're not allowing me. <laughs> now, yes. let's, now let's talk about the workflow. Yes, the Ninja 5 records in ProRes RAW and uh, Apple ProRes RAW has a flaw. It's not very good for shooting events or long shots. So we have this problem because in the events you tend to shoot, you know, just a long shot, just, you know, to make sure that you have a lot of information and everything. And sometimes you go from outside to inside and you have a huge change in exposure. So the only way you could get around it is to cut down the pieces that you want and then export them and then import them back. Or import them in uh, multiple folders. Oh yeah, or Practically yeah, yeah. You have to have them or you can duplicate or triple. Yeah, you and, can and duplicate the... Every other, sh every other exposure from other yeah. folder, which is stupid. Or you can just, you can duplicate the clip in the same folder, but then rename it differently. If you yeah, don't yeah, want to yeah. have like a zillion folders. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's, 
that's it's definitely dumb. yeah it's clumsy it's Ugh. it's practically they didn't think of that don't and that's do that weird mm. that's very the, weird. these people are too professional to shoot events they didn't think about that i don't know all. i don't know final cut has its issues you know final cut seems professional and they work a professional but the last few times that uh, that apple talked about their devices they constantly compared how their devices worked with davinci resolve which is very weird you know because it's not there it's black magics mm. still they're constantly Im improving how their devices the work work is in with da vinci. da vinci yeah and and they practically final cut is admitting defeat his final cut is yeah it's kind of going slower as in in terms of progressing yeah, to deal with yeah. this media but i i bet they'll do something about it i i'm not worried that you know they're not thinking about it kind final of like cut. yeah final cut trying oh, yeah. to like offer you being able to work with pro restore files and just change the way it's you know exposed and everything in the timeline mm. not in, in the, the modify raw settings yeah something yeah, yeah it should or be in the timeline for sure yeah that's really well, odd that well, it's of not course you can do it you, know, you can ash you can add the hdr tools and you can like you know do your they've own done, lots yeah, and they've everything. done improvements on it but you can't change iso you can't change you ISO. can't change the iso now in the timeline or in the settings in the settings no in the timeline i mean so anything that's camera raw in yeah. final cut yeah it's um well it's not called if camera you're gonna raw, change it's called white balance settings. or iso you can only do it from that camera you, you're changing the whole thing. file so you're yeah, going to yeah. change the whole yeah, file yeah, instead sure. of changing the, the the pieces you chose for the timeline and and Which, they already saw it from yeah footage Thanks. this is gonna be lo the longest Thanks. conclusion ever you're probably gonna cut it like a hundred percent okay yeah. so you're you were saying about the pro file the first thing that you said and the only thing that we talked about was the fact that you can't make multiple changes on exposure inside a clip yeah and then my other problem is the fact that it doesn't have uh, a highlight recovery button yeah and i've tried to bring down the highlights with you know Totally. a whole bunch yeah. of ways and it, it still doesn't do the same still, thing still you're not having the highlight recovery button on the ProRes RAW but on Ninja 5 it's much easier for you to tell in Ninja yes. 5 you know how the exposure the actual works. exposure just by yes. looking at it yeah you don't have to guess as in anything for video assist you just have like yeah. a red 709 yeah, type of image. Uh, image you know so that's one good thing about ProRes RAW yeah it's like the one yeah. the one thing to the rule one them. good tool yeah yeah Ninja so 5. i've noticed that in some lighting environments mm -hmm. the image looks better as in it looks closer to what you're gonna get when you import the file mm -hmm. if you choose the hlg monitoring system mm -hmm. and in some shots it's better if you use the native system yeah native monitoring that's in option. Ninja 5 or, yeah uh, yeah have you noticed that yeah i have noticed uh actually uh, the pq the pq that's, I didn't like the PQ. That's why we we used the PQ, and that was kind of like the exposure that did we did. You use the PQ? Yeah, we did. We we used the PQ at the seaside like two years ago. Apparently, he likes the PQ setting more. Okay, that's fair. So basically, what we're saying is that as long as you don't press the Rec 709 or maybe the LUT, because the LUT is like something that you apply on the Rec 709. Yeah then you know you're set so you have a lot of options to monitor the image yeah, in yeah, a yeah. very close environment yeah the guys like at the... Atomos definitely understood what comes out of the sigma fp and yeah. made sure that they're gonna give you a flat image flat well image. as flat yeah. as possible yeah. yes yes unfortunately the sigma doesn't give you a flat image on its screen and uh, <laughs> the black magic video assist gives you a rec 709 <laughs> so yeah you're practically constantly having a lot on a lot. A lot. A, a lot. A lot. Uh, you know what I find odd? Mm -hmm. The fact that when Sigma FP fixed the um, false colors, yeah, it didn't automatically change the way the normal image is displayed. I know. Because if you try to expose close to the clipping limits, you're going to see, you know, all your image in the Rec. 709 is going to look super clipped. And then when you press the AL button and go to false colors, you're going to see the fact that you've exposed lower than the clipping point mm. and everything looks fine. Mm. And you have all the details, you know, in your false colors, mm. colors. And then like, why can't you just <laughs> take the flatness that is shown in the false colors and display it in the normal image? Well, 
it's it's what I think. I don't know exactly, but I think uh, they practically built something, mm -hmm. and it was you know kind of they didn't know exactly how to build it in some way that they would control all of these things. And they, they started kind of trying to learn how they will control these things on the camera. So Sigma FP, it's kind of like a uh, a, be a beginner's try to build a, a camera that oh, can shoot raw. Yeah. You know, it, it just it just looks like that. It's an amazing camera, don't get me wrong. Like, that's why we have it. But mm. uh, it's clear to me that they couldn't find a way to make it work with what it was promising to do well you know? i mean they did the update on the false colors which was super important yeah. and then they also did the al stuff yeah but EL, EL for zone. some reason the EL zone stuff. they can't do a flat image they can't give you a, like a, a log file they make you uh a, or at least a log a display like a, an off color mode oh off, that doesn't even you know? count because that's on mov not on raw because raw is raw it is it, it just doesn't show you <laughs> it all you know. right, because you were saying that if they could apply the look that you get from the flat that I yeah, image. Yeah, yeah, like the Ninja 5 narrows it down perfectly. It's like, yeah. it's right there. You can see a, a log kind of look. Yeah. Sigma never made a video camera before. You know, it's practically their first try. The other ones were just... Just do a firmware with camera. the freaking flat well, image. That was it. They they brought a lot of firmwares. Like, we're at 5 it's right like, now. Like like 5.1, I think, or 5.2. I don't even know. Yeah, it's a 5 point something. And uh, they brought a lot of stuff on the table and a lot of things that we complained about, they sorted it out. And the other ones are like, you know, childish ones like autofocus or, you know. <laughs> but, Who needs autofocus? It's but for an A professional need for, you know, being able to kind of see, you know, the full dynamic mm -hmm. range of your camera on the monitor that it comes with yeah, would have been like, you know, what what, what would you call that? A good like, thing. A very good thing. A very good thing. Like a professional thing. The conundrum that you have with Sigma FP with these display issues is that you have a very functioning false colors as you know, we saw and we looked at and mm. we tested and everything and the zone, but that's beside the point right now. Mm. But then you can't make use of these mm. if you hook it up to any um, outside. Yeah, if, if you, if you uh, put raw output, if you yes. output raw through any HDMI cable, you're done. You can't use false colors. Yeah, you're Goodbye. done. Goodbye. Yeah. And then the they're practically telling you, ah, so you're not using ours, then <laughs> use whatever the other ones have, which is... Uh, well, yes, you don't like CDNG, then you don't get to properly expose your image. That's yes. what you get. Yeah. Unless you have an Atomos and you don't use false colors and you use the flat monitoring. Yeah, yeah. see, it's like, like that. But with all these said, Blackmagic like Raw is <laughs> still the choice for us. For life. Lame people. Lame people. What else did I want to say? Yes, the workflow. Obviously, the raw that you're going to choose also depends on what you are more likely to use as an editing software. Mm, yeah. So if you're a Final Cut user, then, well, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. Basically. I mean, you're going to have to have a weird workflow. So if you're a Final Cut user and you want to record in Blackmagic, you will record in Blackmagic. You oh. will do proxy files in um, ProRes Proxy or in yeah. H.264. Uh, you will put them in Final Cut. You'll do the cuts, you know, generally do the cuts and then import in DaVinci. Oh, well, there is no fun in that. And then, yeah, there is, yeah, that's practically I wonder very, how many people out there are uh, Premiere users. There are many Premiere users. Yeah. Actually, most I mean, from used... the people that watch these clips. Oh, I have no So idea. maybe let us know in the comments. That would be interesting to know yeah, how you what, guys what work you use. With, for color grading. I think DaVinci is the, the master. One. Long, yeah. long, for but long, then again, Premiere, I, I feel like someone told me this, that they've done, and this is like two years ago, they've done a few updates that made the color grading process and everything look more like DaVinci. Well, Final Cut as well they yeah. they definitely yeah. made big steps towards a, they have more better, choices yeah. where you used to have the color wheel and then there there were like a couple more options and mm -hmm. now there's like i think one or two more mm. i don't really use them because i don't like them mm. i'm not such a professional grader i guess well, she's she's a da vinci grader she the greatest grades grades yes. in da vinci like the laudari 
Uh, what did we talk about? We talked about... You were talking about workflow, because I didn't get to ask yes. you which one sorry. do you prefer, but it's kind of implied, because you it's already implied. started talking about the workflow. So I would definitely do a project that's not events. I would definitely grade it in DaVinci. Mm -hmm. So when we do events, we don't actually use Sigma FP because we prefer to use something that has a very good autofocus. So we use the Sony system. We used Sigma a few times where we didn't have... Uh, we, you know, we use it as a third camera. We kind of use it as a third camera and usually we record in Blackmagic. Blackmagic, yeah. yeah. Because yes, of the battery we life do. and everything. Yeah. So if we don't shoot events, I prefer to use DaVinci for sure. There's just so many more ways to uh, deal with your image and to do masks on faces and stuff like that. So from this point of view, I would just use Blackmagic and CDNGA wouldn't bother with Paris Raw at all. I find that the bureau files are easier to manage in terms of CPU and stuff like that than CDNG. They run faster, mm. so that's also one well, thing. Well, that depends on the machine you're working on. Yeah, well, I mean... For now, you're on a M2 Mac Mini Pro, M2 mm -hmm. Pro Mac Mini. That's what yes, you have. Yes, we used to have countless uh, RAMs, RAM gig gigabytes, and yeah, now RAM, we don't. Yeah. Yes, and now it's a sad world with very few RAMs. Yes, uh, we, we changed our iMacs, our Intel iMacs for M2 and M1 Pro. And Everything is much smoother, but then sometimes you is, can see it. Yeah, when, you're, when you want to issue. render and stuff, you, you kind of get into that moment. Well, the color grading workflow is much smoother. Mm. I find the image is nicer. It has a bit of a maybe reddish or brownish tint. Mm. It's not too much. It just makes the skin tone look much better. The skin tone in CDNG, well, the whole image is a bit more yellow mm. and maybe a little bit more green, but just a bit. So it's much easier to get a very good looking skin tone from the very beginning with B-Raw. And the image is much flatter. I mean the image if you use Blackmagic Design with Blackmagic Design Film. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and one more thing, the metadata that you can change from the camera raw menu is more extensive in Blackmagic than it is in CDNG. Mm. And it's less noisy, which mm. you know, if you're a purist, you're gonna be like, no, I want it with more noise because it's more data, but it doesn't look great. And the noise from CDNG is not monotone. Mm. It has some like uh, magenta grains. And I think maybe you can distinguish between green and blue as well, but I'm not entirely sure. So anyway, you have definitely more color noise mm. than you have in Blackmagic. So I'm pretty sure that both Peresra and Bureau do some denoising when they package your raw mm. but it's not extensive so the image is still sharp the noise that you do get when you use these raws is monotone mm. so it's much easier to denoise mm. than cdng that's quite odd mm, how come well you would expect you know to have uh, cdng being more clean no actually because yeah. cdng is uncompressed mm. So you're expecting it to be the noisiest mm -hmm. because there's nothing, there's no noise reduction applied. Mm. I'm not seeing any difference in terms of details, mm. like from the footage. Mm. And that goes for all of them. So in terms of detail and in terms of the range of shadows or mm -hmm. the range of stuff that you can see in the middle exposure zones or in the shadows is kind of the same. Mm. I mean, it is it is is the same everywhere for all the rows. I don't see what CDNG can give you more of that you're not already getting in Bureau, mm. honestly. Then again, and I did say this, I never used the Aces workflow. I played with it for like one video, but uh, I didn't get into it. That's a video. It's gonna That's... be a long time before we see this video. Mm. You have reached the end of this video. I congratulate you. And if you've watched until now, you're definitely going to be able to push that subscribe button. A like wouldn't be a problem. And a nice comment there, right there, you know, just to make us feel warm and cozy. Can't. After Cosmina's work 
on this entire it's literally half video. Mad. Yeah. Yeah. So this is also the end of the Sigma saga. I'm going to be erasing all the files that I've taken. No, you're going to do an Aces one at some point. No. Well, with new footage. This is four terabytes worth, yeah. <laughs> worth of stuff. Yeah. No more. It's we, been two years, I think. Well, we just shot our first short. Like, yes. Our first, like, like really, really half professional shot. <laughs> I would say professional because we had, you know, we tried. A, a we small tried team. at a professional <laughs> level. actors and <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna talk about the workflow with that, and we're gonna talk about the pr we're gonna production. talk about lighting probably with that, and we're gonna talk about the lights that we used because uh, we yes. bought some new lights. Yes, so much money was given. They're not that very day. new, but they're new to they're us. They're very dancing. And we're That's definitely cool. gonna talk about them. At some point. At some point. Uh, okay, one last thing. If you speak Russian, don't forget to check out Ilya's channel. He does an extensive discussion on everything that you see here. He's done a very good job with uh, all the other videos in the series. So uh, hopefully he's gonna pick up this one as well. Yeah. Well, okay. if Sigma FP is still on... <laughs> on the market by the time we <laughs> release this. On the conversation list. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is the end of Sigma forever. Thank you for watching. Thank you for staying tuned. Thank you for staying subscribed to us, even though we didn't put up much in the last few months. Thank you for sticking with us. And um, I hope we bring you more and more of these things that you can watch. Hopefully it's not going to take us, you know, six months to bring you the next video. But who knows? Yeah. Okay.